Too many cookies, another scoop of ice cream, or that extra piece of your mom's famous layer cake. Have you ever overdosed a bit on sugar? Well, that's what we're talking about today as we continue our journey through the Old Testament book of Proverbs. Welcome to Through the Bible with our teacher, Dr. J. Vernon McGee. I'm Steve Schwetz, and in our study, we're going to hear that God compares flattery to an overdose of honey. So sweet, it'll make you sick. We'll all discover what God thinks of hypocrisy and pride. And I'm going to tell you now, it's not pretty. So here's Dr. McGee to lay the groundwork for this section of Scripture, and then we'll be back to pray together before we begin in Proverbs chapter 29, verse 5. We have seen that we've had a great deal said here in these last few chapters about hypocrisy, about being something that we're not. And today we're going to be looking at several proverbs that deal with this. How a man that flattereth his neighbor spreadeth a net for his feet. Man deceives you by flattery in order to take you. The hypocrisy that is abroad today ought to keep every Christian alert, both in the church and out of the church, because personally I think there are more hypocrites out of the church than are in the church. But now here's a letter, and I'm not going to say where it has come from because I do not want to identify the individual at all. And so I'll not even mention the place it comes from. I can mention the state, and that's from right here in California. Now, a great many people think that I'm extremely hard on church members and especially on those that there's some question about their salvation. And it's letters like this that we've been receiving that make me rather cynical today about certain professions of faith today that I hear about. Now, I'm just lifting out an excerpt because I don't want this person identified. He says, in the past, I went around saying to people, that I was a born-again Christian when I was not. I even went as far as being baptized to tell people that I was saved when I was not. The Lord has led me to listen to your program on the radio, and I have to say that by listening to your program on the radio, the Lord has spoken to my heart. He's also, through His Word, opened up a new way for me to go and to live the life that he wants me to live. May I say to you, you'd be amazed if I mentioned even where this individual is. And this is typical. I had a letter recently from a man who said that he was an officer in a certain denomination in a certain local church that has a good reputation, and that he also had taught Sunday school and said he and his wife had been listening to our program regularly for the past few months, and all of a sudden they realized that they actually had never really accepted Christ as their Savior. There's so many like that today, and I would say this to you if you're listening today, friend, church member, you haven't really accepted Christ as your Savior. You're really not saved. If you have not, come to Him. He says, he that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. You must come to him and accept forgiveness of sins and accept from him a salvation for eternity. I trust you'll come. Well, I extend that same invitation to you today. If you're listening and you want to know Jesus Christ personally, and you want to receive His gift of salvation, just visit our website, ttb.org, and click on How Can I Know God? There you're going to find several downloadable resources that we've set aside just for you, including Dr. McGee's popular explanation of God's grace titled, The Faith Equation, Faith Plus Nothing Equals Salvation. Again, you'll find us online at ttb.org. Or if you'd prefer that we send you a couple of these resources by mail, call 1-800-65-BIBLE. It would be our honor to share with you about the joy of our lives, our Savior Jesus Christ. So please call or visit the website today. To encourage you to take that step, let me read a letter from Amari, a listener who joins us from Ethiopia. I'm a high school student and will take my final examinations at the end of this month. 
I started to follow through the Bible a few years ago. Recently, I decided to give my life to Jesus. This program encourages me to read my Bible thoroughly every day. I've learned a lot of things that God is our protector, provider, and healer. Please pray that I might continue to grow in my faith. Well, if you want to pray for Through the Bible listeners like Amari around the world, why don't you hop aboard the Bible bus each day in more than 250 languages and sign up for our world prayer team at ttb.org forward slash pray. Now, as a member of this team, each weekday you're going to receive an email with prayer prompts and stories of God's work in the lives of people just like you and me. We can't wait to travel with you. So again, be sure to sign up today at ttb.org forward slash pray. Now let's give this time to the Lord as we study it. Heavenly Father, we enter into your presence today and we rejoice in your goodness and in your mercy towards us. Make this time together eternally profitable, for we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's turn to Proverbs 29 as we make our way through the Bible with Dr. J. Vernon McGee. Now we come back to the 29th chapter of the book of Proverbs, and we're putting in here at verse 5, and it reads, A man that flattereth his neighbor, spreadeth a net for his feet. I think that there are times when praise and applause for a man that's doing a good job is certainly an order, and merit should be recognized, of course, and it's always proper. And I'm not sure but what there's a time to stand up and cheer for an individual. But when flattery is used, it is like the overdose of honey that we've been reading about in the book of Psalms. And there are some folk that you know, the very minute they begin to speak to you, they're flattering you. They're not really telling you the thing that's upon their heart. When I was a pastor, I had a man that was always making certain requests of you and asking certain favors. And when he would call on the phone, I always knew the minute My secretary said he was on the phone. I knew he wanted something. And he always began the same way. And it went something like this. Oh, Dr. McGee, I was listening to you this past week on the radio. And I want to tell you, I never heard a message like that. I hope you're putting that message into print. Well, you know, the minute he started talking like that, I knew he was after something. And the more flattering the things he said, it was the bigger favor that he was going to ask for. Flattery is a dangerous thing because sometimes people believe it. And it's tragic when we believe flattery. Now, we have here, and I'm dropping down now to verse 10. It says, Men of blood hate the perfect, but the just seek or care for his soul. Let me give it as we have it now in our authorized version. The bloodthirsty hate the upright, but the just seek his soul. This means a bloodthirsty man, a man that has murder and hate in his heart. And the Lord Jesus said that if you hate your brother, well, you're guilty of murder. And Cain was guilty of murder, you see. And it was in his heart. And if you want to know how far man has fallen and how quickly he can fall, remember that God had created Adam and Eve, created them perfect. And now Adam and Eve fell. And the only thing they can bring into the world is a sinner. They brought forth in their likeness sons and daughters. Well, Cain was one of them. And here this boy is born with murder in his heart. He hates his brother. What a picture. And then we have verse 11. A fool uttereth all his mind, but a wise man keepeth it back. A fool, you talk with him, he'll tell you everything. But a wise man will hold back. He'll be very careful of what he's going to say. Verse 12. If a ruler hearken to lies, all his servants are lawless. And that's the reason that, and we've had this before, that child that will steal from the parents, which simply means this, that the parent ought to always punish a child for taking anything that doesn't belong to him, even from the parent. Why? Because the child will imitate that. And that's true of any man in a high position. 
his conduct will be reflected in those that are underneath him. And that is the picture that you have. Now, I want to drop down to verse 17. Correct thy son, and he shall give thee rest. Yea, he shall give delight unto thy soul. And this follows in that connection. And then verse 18, where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keepeth the law, happy is he. Now, we've had that before, but the thing that's interesting here, we have this statement, where there is no vision, the people perish, but he that keepeth the law, happy is he. And the thing that's important here, a vision means actually spiritual understanding are actually the work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer to give him understanding of the Word of God. We are told that in 1 Samuel 3, 1, the Word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. Well, the Word of the Lord was precious. That is, there was no understanding of the Word of God and what was precious in those days. Now, God raised up Samuel, a seer, to meet that, you know. And you remember that even Moses could say, would God that all the Lord's people were prophets, that is, had an understanding of the Word of God. I personally think a spiritual discernment is one of the gifts that God has given to the church, by the way. Now, I'm going to pass over many of these proverbs. Actually, They've been before us, couched in a little different language before. Now, this chapter actually concludes the collection of Proverbs that were copied out and collected by the men of Hezekiah. And now we have actually all the Proverbs that are really attributed to Solomon. However, I believe the last chapter, which we'll come to, was written by Solomon himself. But now in chapter 30... We come to the words of Agur. We are told here the words of Agur, the son of Jakey, the prophecy that man spake unto Ithiel, even unto Ithiel and Eucal. I don't know those brethren, but this is from an unknown seer, an unknown writer. And the interesting thing here is that these proper names here are like all Hebrew names, they have been translated by some as just common nouns because they do mean something. And it would be the words of a gatherer, the son of the pious. And that could be the translation. However, I don't think that that would be it at all. And verse 4 is a very interesting verse. Who hath ascended up into heaven or descended? Who hath gathered the wind in his fists? Who hath bound the waters in a garment? Who hath established all the ends of the earth? What is his name? And what is his son's name? If thou canst tell. Now, this is a question. You remember that God asks Job the question. Who is able to answer these questions? Well, the Lord Jesus said, No man hath ascended up to heaven. But he that came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. Now, that's my reason for saying constantly that the Lord Jesus is the only authority on this matter of creation, the matter of origins of the universe. Now, I very candidly believe that none of us have the correct explanation. I don't think science has. In fact, the very matter that they've come up with evolution means they do not have the answer to origins. And the reason that we've spent so much money to go to the moon was to get rocks that we might find out about the origin of the universe. Now, there are those that take the first verse of Genesis, and they say this is it. I say that's it too. But then they take the next verse, and they say, well, this tells about the creation. My friend, I don't think God told you about the creation. I believe in the gap theory myself. I'm old-fashioned. I'm a real square. And I believe that in spite of what these new books, these new, sharp, clever young men that are writing today, 
I just don't believe that God has let you in on it, friend. Who hath ascended up into heaven or descended? When did you make the trip, brother, that gave you all this new information and light? I don't care whether you're a scientist or a theologian. You don't know. And I'd like to make that emphatic. You don't know. And God says, where were you when I laid the foundation of the world? So you don't have the answer at all. And I like the expression here, who gathered up the wind in his fist? Just think, God holds the wind just like you would hold an article of some kind in your hand. What a picture. And man knows very little about these things. And that same passage where the Lord Jesus said, He was the one that came down from heaven. He also said, the wind bloweth where it listed. You hear the sound now. You can't not tell where it comes, where it's going. This is a tremendous verse. Now, we have some marvelous verses here, and I can only just mention them in passing. It says, verse 5, every word of God is pure. Nothing will clean you up like that. Every word of God is pure. It's not just 99 and 44, 100% pure. This is not ivory soap. It's better than ivory soap. It's a miracle cleanser. Every word of God's pure. He is a shield unto them that put their trust in him. Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. God doesn't mind calling you a liar, but you better not call him one. And then we have here, Two things have I required of thee. Deny me them not before I die. Remove far from me vanity and lies. And that means this. I don't want to live among those that are vain and are flattering and those that are lying. It's like living in a rattlesnake den to live with folk like that. And then he says, give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me. Give me a good diet. Let me take the middle of the road. (laughs) And don't be an extremist either way. Then he says there is a generation that are pure in their own eyes and yet not washed from their filthiness. And now I know there are folk that will say, very frankly, there are a lot of church members like that. They are a generation. They're all alike that take the position that they are pure in their own eyes. They don't need a savior. They're just religious. And then there are those today that are high up in business. They feel the same way. And there's many a down and outer that even then he feels that he's all right in his own eyes, but he's not washed. None of these are washed and they can only be washed by the blood of Christ. And then down verse 15, we have another wonderful statement. The horse leash hath two daughters crying, give, give. Have you ever ridden horseback? You have two reins, and you have to hold back on those reins because constantly each one of them is saying, give, give, let go, let me run. But you better hold up on the reins or you'll have a runaway horse. And that is something that today in life, my friend, self-control, holding back, And you remember David had said, don't be like the mule or the horse that has to have a bit in its mouth to hold it back and to guide it. Turn this matter over to the Lord. Then he says, there are three things that are never satisfied. Yea, four things say not. It's enough. There are four things that never satisfy, never have enough. First is the grave. And you and I living in a funeral procession today, all of us, are in a funeral procession. It began outside the Garden of Eden with Abel, and it's been coming down through the centuries. And as we said the other day, this old world we live on is a great big cemetery. That's what it is, where people are buried. The grave, never satisfied, and the barren womb. Oh, there's so many women that can't have children for one reason or another, and they're the ones, I think, that make such wonderful mothers of adopted children. And they're never satisfied. They want that little precious one to put its little chubby hands around the neck and somebody to call him mother. (laughs) In the same way about father. And then the earth that is not filled with water. We don't ever get enough rain out here in California. We need more rain. Actually, 
out here we have too much fire and not enough rain. This is the thing. Too little rain in California and too much fire. That's our picture. And then, and the fire that saith not, it's enough. I wonder when we're going to burn off all of the mountains of California. I thought we'd run out of mountains a long time ago, but apparently we haven't. These are four things that are never satisfied. Tremendous statement, is it not? Now, we have here verse 17, the eye that mocketh at his father despiseth to obey his mother. The ravens of the valley shall pick it out, and the young eagles shall eat it. Tremendous judgments are pronounced against those who turn against father and mother. God have mercy on the young man today that's turned away from his father and mother. They're believers in Christ, and I trust set the right example. Verse 18, there be three things which are too wonderful for me, yea, four which I know not. And since the writer here, Agur, didn't know, I don't guess I know either, so I can just mention them and pass on. Will you notice? He says here, the way of an eagle in the air. You ever see an eagle flying in the air? I don't quite understand it myself. The way of a serpent upon a rock. You ever see a serpent on a rock? And the way of a ship in the midst of the sea. Always been a mystery to me how... I went across the Atlantic in the Queen Mary years ago, of course, and I just wondered how that great ship made of iron could float. The way of a ship in the midst of the sea, and then the last one, it's a wonderful, the way of a man with a maid. <laughs> Have you ever noticed these young folk, even today, where we hear so much about sex, when you see one of these young fellows about 14 years old, meets a girl. Have you ever noticed how awkward the boy is? How embarrassed both of them are? The little thing that happens. I remember when I was a very young man. Actually, it was my first date that I had. And it was back before I was saved. I would have a notion I was about 14. Because I started early. I didn't want to miss anything. And we were going to a movie. I was taking this girl to a movie and walking down the street. Years ago, men used to wear garters to hold their socks up. Well, mine came loose and it was dragging. Oh, my, you talk about embarrassed. I never was so embarrassed in my life. And I didn't have sense enough to just stop and step up to the side and by a store window up an alleyway. I just went down the street dragging that. And I never shall forget, I had a crowd after a while, and that made it even worse. And a girl got red in the face, and I got red in the face, and I don't think we said anything for a couple of hours after that happened. The way of a man with a maid. It's quite unusual, isn't it? Four things that he said he didn't understand. I still don't think I understand them. Now we going to have to leave right off there today, but we're going to finish next time because we are coming to some very wonderful things in this chapter. We're going to visit a zoo, look at some of the animals that are there. And did you know animals have a message for us today? God created them for many purposes. One of them, they give a message to us. We'll see that next time. And then a wonderful Mother's Day message in 31, but it's not Mother's Day, but we're going to have it because this is the time for us in going through the Bible. So until next time, may God richly bless you, my beloved. The book of Proverbs has something for everyone, doesn't it? If there is a woman that you'd like to honor, why don't you invite her to listen next time as we study Proverbs 31. And as Dr. McGee mentioned, be sure to join us as we hear about the message God has for us through the amazing animals that he created. If you're enjoying this study in Proverbs and you want to share it with a friend, just visit ttb.org. We've got apps and podcasts. We've got station listenings. There's version plans that you can be a part of and more. And we want this program to be easily accessible to you and the important people in your life. So again, visit ttb.org for your many options. Or to be in touch, you can call us, 1-800-65-BIBLE is the number. You can write to us at Box 7100, Pasadena, California, 91109. 
In Canada, Box 25325, London, Ontario, N6C, 6B1. I'm Steve Schweitz. For all of us at Through the Bible, we're praying that you would grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ as you walk with him today. Jesus made it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Through the Bible exists to take God's whole word to the whole world. And we invite you to stand with us with your faithful prayer and financial support. Where will God's word go today?